I'll have him put the slides for me. Um, I was commissioned to be an Army chaplain. Um, been all, all up and down the East Coast with our first duty station at Fort Bliss, Texas. Um, then went to the Old Guard at Fort Myer, Virginia. Um, yeah, I don't even know where I've been now. Um, Fort Bragg, North Carolina, Fort Jackson, South Carolina, and now we're headed back to Virginia. So um, I'll get a chance to step out of a little bit of the, the more direct ministry to soldiers and being a little bit more of the administrative side. So as I preach this message tonight, I realize how much God is pushing me out of my comfort zone, so you get to hear that a little bit too. Um, hit the next button for me. Um, this is Shelly and Charlene. Um, a few weeks ago, I realized I didn't have an up-to-date picture, so that's the three of us. You got, you'll get to see them a little bit as well. Um, 2008, um, I got to meet a now a dear friend, Jason Lathers, and that picture on the right uh, mainly highlights him and his wife, Amy. Um, he's a reserve army chaplain, pastor in um, Indiana. We were supposed to link up with him last week, and I totally flaked. Didn't hit him up as we drove through, but um, he was a second lieutenant in the United States Army, commissioned, but decided that he was gonna pursue chaplaincy. So went to seminary for a couple of years and ended up going to the reserve side and has been a real blessing as we've talked over time to get to know him. But um, really I wanna thank you for your partnership in the gospel. Um, you all have been great and gracious, uh, this congregation sending care packages, letting us know you're praying for us, um, connecting on Facebook, seeing how we're doing, all that kind of stuff. And it's, a, it's a huge blessing to us. Um, but uh, the next for me. If you think about it, there's a few things that are unique about soldiers. And uh, I'm going to be specific here for a second and say there's a difference between soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines. Uh, we might throw a Coast Guard in there too, but, you know, um, I like to give them a hard time. Um, if you know, there's a good sibling rivalry between the services. Um, we all like to make fun of the Air Force. That's a fun thing. Um, I mean, they're like the military, they just get recess. So that's it. That's a good thing. Um, and the Marines, the acronym means muscles are required, intelligence is not essential. So if you're wondering what that means, they'll come back at us and they'll say that Army stands for ain't ready to be a Marine yet. So, you know, um, but I want you to think for a second about what it means to be a warrior or a warfighter in our military. Uh, there's a few things that are unique. We follow orders. Um, we sacrifice our life for a larger cause. We move often. I told you about four moves in eight years. Uh, and there's other stories around here as well. Um, they return from combat to reconnect the lives and families that they left at home. Um, there's something else unique. We have our own subculture, our own language, our own pressures, our own labels, and our own attitudes and expectations. And um, if you ever see me stop for a second if I'm talking, I'm trying to figure out an acronym and what it means to explain it to you so I don't have to go into my own language. Deployments are an interesting challenge too. Um, one of the soldiers I was deployed with wrote something on his Facebook, just kind of offhand. He wrote, the thing about this place is that life is on pause, for us at least. The place that we once knew is home. A place where you had the comfort of your bed, your family, your friends, your hobbies, or the choice of going to get whatever food you felt like eating for dinner that night. That was home. But the longer you're here, deployed, the more that image of what home was begins to fade. And then he said you can press play anytime. Oftentimes, I think it's important to notice that those who serve the public are forced out of their comfort zone um, to serve others in a way they never expected. So let me just ask you, um, have you ever had a time when God took you out of your comfort zone? Maybe it was a new job. <coughs> you get to a place, they tell you a little bit about what your job is going to be, you have that piece of paper, your job description, and you step into that job and then try to figure out what that looks like once you're there. Uh, maybe it's that you lost a job. Trying to figure out, okay God, what do you want next of me? Uh, maybe it's you're not sure what to do after school, for the summer a year, for high school, for college, all those questions. What's next, God? Uh, maybe it's just reaching out to a coworker. You work in a cubicle farm, and uh, you look across the cubicle, you know somebody's struggling a little bit, and you try to figure out what's going on with them and how you can be a blessing to them. That's a comfort zone. Uh, maybe I shouldn't get involved in that person's life, but maybe God's pushing us to do so. And maybe it's just bringing up God's grace in your life. Maybe it's the Easter egg hunt or inviting somebody to VBS. Just handing out a flyer is, God, I don't know if I want to push that. 
Maybe they'll think weird of me. Okay. Well, Peter had one of those opportunities. Um, he was brought out of his comfort zone and put face to face with an important soldier, or just a soldier, really. Um, I think it's interesting that God works in two people's lives at the same time the one who knows God and the one who will soon do so. Let me pray with you. And God, thank you so much for the opportunity to be pushed by a gracious God who loves us, who challenges us, who develops us, and who directs our steps. Um, God, help us to understand your word tonight and help us to live because of it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Um, if you turn with me to Acts chapter 10, I think I mentioned that. But uh, I want you to think about the book of Acts for a second. The book of Acts is uh, the Christian church, the new Christian church, being pushed out of their comfort zone. In Acts chapter 1, really, the, um, the believers were scared. They knew Jesus had risen from the dead. They didn't know what was next. So they were hiding in the upper room, trying to understand the Old Testament, what we know as the Old Testament, the Hebrew Scriptures, and trying to figure out what God wanted with them. <coughs> Acts chapter 2, we see God change everything in a instant. God takes them and he makes he infills them and dwells them with the Holy Spirit. And at that point they began to minister to the nations. Just before that, Acts chapter 1 verse 8, the Bible says but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in Judea and all Samaria and even to the remotest parts of the earth. Don, can you hit the next button for me? Um so I want you to think about this for a second. Out through Acts chapter 9, we see it regularly, and then we get to Acts chapter 10. So Acts chapter 2, they reach out to the nations. All the nations hear the word of God in their own language. Acts chapter 6, 7, and 8 are the <coughs> first deacons, the first opportunity for people to serve and reach out to, to others and serve them. Um, and then one stands up by the name of Stephen. And Stephen, I always thought, was just kind of calm and collected, but when I realized what he was really doing, he was confronting all the religious leaders of the community, of the, the, of the Jewish community, and saying, you guys have continuously ignored God. And you talk about stepping out of your comfort zone. Then we get to Acts chapter 8, where Philip is walking along the road one day, and God says to him, hey, see that chariot over there? Go and talk to the guy. And he walks up alongside the chariot, and this Ethiopian high chief mucky muck guy is reading through Isaiah 53. And asks, Philip asks him, do you understand what you're reading? Would you walk alongside the presidential motorcade and ask him if they know what they're reading? If you could get there, I understand. But <laughs> he stepped out of his comfort zone and was pulled up on the chariot to explain Isaiah 53. And that gentleman was baptized. And if you notice the continent of Africa, a lot of the eastern, con the east eastern part of the continent is Christian because of the influence of the Ethiopian eunuch that went back to his home and spread the gospel. And now a lot of the, the West is Muslim. But then you get to Acts chapter 9 where Paul is, Saul is walking along um, with the intent of staying in his comfort zone of persecuting Christians. And God says, hey... Let me show you something. When you talk about out of, your, out of your comfort zone, you look at Ananias' reaction in that. Ananias is sitting at home one day and gets a message, gets a voicemail, okay, a little bit better than that, from God. And God says, hey, I want you to go talk to Saul. And Ananias immediately knows who this guy is. And Ananias' response is, God, I think you got the wrong guy. And that's the Mark Worrell version, but he says, do you know who you're talking about, God? Do you know who this is? And so then we get to Acts chapter 10. Peter is taking a vacation in Joppa. <coughs> and God says, Peter, I want you to take a minute, and I want you to do something different. And let's look at that together. I think Cornelius is pushed out of his comfort zone. Um, the first few verses here of Acts chapter 10 say, uh, Now there was a man at Caesarea named Cornelius, a centurion <coughs> which called the Italian cohort. A devout man and one who feared God with all his, all his household and gave many alms to the Jewish people and prayed to God continually. About the ninth hour of the day, he clearly saw in a vision an angel of God who had just come in and said to him, Cornelius. 
And fixing his gaze on him and being much alarmed, he said, What is it, Lord? And he said to him, Your prayers and your alms have ascended as a memorial before God. I think it's interesting that God says that a, an unbeliever was noticed by God. Not that he had a relationship with him. Not that he knew what it meant to be a follower of Christ, but he had a relationship. or he, God knew of Cornelius. <coughs> Typically, a centurion was a commander of a hundred men in the um, Roman army. They had typically worked their way up from being a foot soldier, and because of their loyalty and their courage, they were recognized and promoted appropriately. They could buy that as well, but uh, typically they were promoted because of their loyalty to the Roman army. Um, when you think about centurions in the Bible, one trusted that Jesus could heal his paralyzed servant without being there physically. Jesus was walking on the road to go to reach out to somebody else, and centurion walked up to Jesus and said, Hey, my servant is paralyzed. I need your help. I'm not even worthy for you to come under my roof. Would you heal him? And Jesus said to this centurion, I've not even seen faith like this in all of Israel. And he was healed from that very moment. Another one um, declared at the cross. As he was in charge of the crucifixion, Jesus was different in his crucifixion. And the centurion said, truly this man was the Son of God. This centurion, specifically that we're talking about in Acts 10, was part of the Italian battalion, of the Italian regiment. Um, he was recognized by God he was seen to be a man that was interested in the things of God. Maybe you've seen those people. Maybe you've seen somebody who's interested in who you are. Your neighbor. Hey, I've noticed all of a sudden you've started going to church. Or you've started leaving on Sunday morning. What's going on? What are you up to? They stand at the end of the driveway and watch you drive out, right? Because they're out mowing the lawn or something. I don't know. Something different. They've seen something. And they're asking questions. Cornelius was told to send a runner to Peter. He was told to send somebody to meet this guy who he'd never met before, but he had a reputation, a reputation from God. Imagine Cornelius, a company commander, sending a delegation to a civilian guy a full day's journey away. <coughs> he realized that it wasn't about his comfort zone. Can you hit the next slide for me? The next thing we see is that Peter's hunger was used to challenge his comfort. So here Peter is one afternoon. I won't read it. You can walk through it a little bit later. But here Peter is one afternoon, kind of that uh, pre-Thanksgiving Day slump. You know what I'm talking about? You've been watching movies or watching football games all morning. Um, maybe you watched the parade. Maybe you had a few snacks. You're really looking forward to the amazing smells coming out of the kitchen. Peter goes up on the, the portico, um, flat roof that they had in the area, and he's just relaxing there and kind of dazes off, dozes off, and wakes up to see a sheet coming down out of heaven. And this sheet had all kinds of unclean animals on it. And unclean animals were pigs, were shellfish, were certain birds, um, bugs. Everybody wants to eat those, right? <laughs> And um, God says to Peter, rise, Peter, kill and eat. And Peter's response is back to his comfort zone. Peter says, not so, Lord. Do those two go to well together? <laughs> no and Lord. I mean, kind of a difficult thing to say. But this happened three times. God said, rise, Peter, kill and eat. And every time Peter <laughs> said, uh-uh, Lord, you got it wrong. Like Ananias, you got the wrong guy. I want you to think about who Peter was for a second. Peter was the guy who was pushed out of his comfort zone multiple times. Can you imagine being in the Sea of Galilee, on the Sea of Galilee, in a boat? And uh, you see something that doesn't make sense. Somebody walking towards you on the water. Of course, it's got to be a ghost because people don't walk on water, right? So Peter 
and all the disciples are saying, are deathly afraid, and they start thinking, well, it's got to be a ghost. And the individual walking on the water convinces them that it's Jesus. He convinces them that it's himself. And Peter, in his ability to jump into anything full force, says, If it's you, Lord, command me to come out to you on the water. Now, what does that look like? What does it look like to be in a boat, <coughs> swing your legs over the edge of the boat, and not expect to fall in the water? Is he doing the balancing act of you know, a balancing beam kind of thing? We can talk a little bit more later about what happened after that. But Peter was pushed out of his comfort zone. Jesus commanded him to come out, and he <laughs> stepped out on the water. Pretty impressive. His faith in who Jesus was, was to say, I'm going to believe you, God. At least for this instant, before I took my eyes off Jesus. He was also the man who saw dead men raised. And Jesus didn't let a funeral finish when he was on the earth. If he was there and saw a funeral procession going, he put, pulled the person out of their coffin, and that kind of ends a funeral, right? Imagine walking alongside a funeral procession and seeing your brother, your sister, your mom, your dad, your child come out of the coffin that's taking them to their final resting place. That made me uncomfortable. That's not supposed to happen. And Jesus turned stuff on its head Peter saw that on a regular basis. He was the guy who's one of the three guys who saw the transfiguration. And if you don't think that Peter was uncomfortable, here they go up on a mountaintop. And Peter sees, Peter, James, and John, see Jesus go from looking sort of like you and I to looking brighter than the sun. His clothes were bright white. The glory of God was shining through Jesus. And Peter's response is, uh, God, uh, let, me, let me make three tents here for you. Still haven't figured out what that means and what Peter was trying to get at. He was uncomfortable. And when Peter was uncomfortable, I think I'm kind of this way too. I opened my mouth. <laughs> hey, some of you are laughing pretty hard. <laughs> Peter was also the guy who denied Christ because he didn't want to be uncomfortable. Jesus was on his way to the cross. And Peter could have testified of who Jesus was to three people at least, if not more, after the garden and before the cross. And because Peter didn't want to be uncomfortable, he said, no, I don't know him. I don't know who he is. And just at that moment, as Peter said the third time, I don't know him, the Bible tells us that Jesus locked eyes with him. And Peter ran out crying. But Jesus takes another opportunity with Peter. After a, a fish fry on the Sea of Galilee, after they go back to fishing trying to figure out what this is all about, Jesus pulls Peter aside and says, Peter, do you love me? I don't know what a walk on the beach looks like with Jesus. It'd be pretty cool. And he asked him three times, and by the third time, you almost see Peter's frustration of, God, I don't know what this means. He says, yes, Lord, you know I love you. Peter was uncomfortable because Jesus was pushing him to the next step. And so now Peter, here, Peter is being pushed to eat pulled pork sandwiches and shellfish. And he doesn't know what to do with it. It doesn't make sense. And just as Peter's thinking through this whole thing of what it means to rise, kill, and eat, isn't God's timing amazing? There's a knock on the door. And what we see with the next slide here is that God's good news is now open to all. God's good news is now open to all. Because at this point, it was restricted to Jerusalem, Judea, and maybe a little bit of Samaria. But as this centurion delegation came to see Peter and Joppa, God opens the gospel to the uttermost parts of the earth. 
And if you want to think about it for a second, God did this kind of a strategic way. A soldier, as you heard me say, I've been in for eight years. I've moved four times. We've moved four times. I'm soon to be five. We're all over the place, and we connect with different people. And God said, you know what? I'm going to take Cornelius. I'm going to reach him, and soon the gospel will go from Cornelius in Caesarea to Rome to open the door for ministry. God did it in a strategic way, kind of like Tracy at a crossroads, right? Reaching the community for Christ as people go to the Bay Area, as people go to the Valley, all over the place. Cornelius was a man who was spoken well by the whole Jewish nation. And as he walks in, he had called a party to involve his friends. He said, I don't know who this guy is, but I want to invite people to hear what Peter has to say about who God is. You know, I think it's interesting to see that people are open to listening to the gospel when we're genuine. When we truly believe what we say we do, and when we live it out, God opens the gospel, or God opens opportunities for us to share the gospel. As Peter walks in, Cornelius bows down to him. And Peter responds, in, no, 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 I'm not the guy you want to worship. I'll point you to him, though. And walks him through the passage that we read a few minutes ago. Peter's response is, stand up, I too am a man. And then he says, God has shown me that I should not call any man common or unclean. But one of the commentaries I read, the New American Commentary, says there was a considerable friction between a good-sized Jewish population in Caesarea and the Gentile community. It's fitting that Peter came to grips with his own prejudices there. But I want you to think about for a second. Have you established any partialities that have kept you from sharing the gospel? Maybe that kept you in your comfort zone. God, maybe I couldn't reach those, piece, those people. You see, it's not about our comfort zone. <clears throat> Verses 34 and 35 tell us that God doesn't show favoritism, but in every nation, the person who fears him and does righteousness is acceptable to him. And I think it's important to notice that God works in the lives of people no matter where they are. Peter was a fisherman. Cornelius was a soldier. And God opened the door to the Gentiles so that we could hear the gospel. Verses 36 to 40 is where Peter really gets to the crux of the matter. Talking about who Jesus was. Let me read that to you. Peter's comment is that the word which he sent to the sons of Israel, preaching peace through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. You yourselves know the thing which took place throughout all Judea, starting from Galilee, after the baptism which John proclaimed. You know of Jesus of Nazareth, how God anointed him with the Holy Spirit and with power, and how he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. We are witnesses of all the things he did, both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They also put him to death by hanging him on the cross. God raised him up on the third day and granted that he become visible. You see, Jesus, the Bible tells us, was anointed with the Holy Spirit. He was different. He was specifically conceived by the Holy Spirit in Mary. He went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil. That sounds so first century, doesn't it? All who were oppressed by the devil. But when you think about it, that's really what sin is. Not, not that we can say the devil made me do it. That, that's the worst excuse known to man. It's an excuse, and that's really all it is. But deceived in the thinking that we can do it on our own. Genesis 3, what happened? The fruit looked good. It was desirable, and they took an ate. Isn't that what we do? We're oppressed by the devil. We want to get into our own comfort zone. So I just say, you know what, God, I don't need you. That's what sin is. It's saying, God, I don't need you. You see, Jesus is still healing the oppressed. That's his, that's the message of the gospel. Is that we're oppressed by sin, we're separated from God, and God opens the door to us to help us see who he is and his grace in our lives. Peter and the other apostles were witnesses, the Bible tells us, and they were forced out of their comfort zone. The verse up here on the screen is John 15, 13. It says, greater love has no man than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. And that's what Jesus did. 
But if you talk to a soldier, especially, they don't know the football verse, John 3.16. Most of them will know John 15.13. You'll see it too t tattooed on arms. You'll see it on memorial walls. Because soldiers typically see that as a verse that's something they can use to talk about their friends that lay down their life for them. I put it up on a, on a wall that I was in charge of building in my last unit. As a bridge to the gospel. <coughs> if you want to build a bridge to a soldier, to a sailor, to an airman, marine, use that verse. Hey, what does that mean? Do you know what 1 Corinthians 15 is really all about? Do you know what John 15 is really all about? Let me walk you through it. And take that opportunity to walk them through it. Because the context there is really neat. As God builds it out of who, where greater love is shown. But Peter comments, he, God ordered us to preach to the people, and everyone who believes in God receives forgiveness. I think that's the ultimate comfort zone. We like our sin. We have our own pet sins that we like to say, God, this is what I want to do, and you can touch anything but this, right? No, God wants to reach into our lives and transform us from the inside out. But as the Holy Spirit indwells the believers there, Peter's kind of astonished. He says the Jewish believers were amazed because the Holy Spirit indwelt the believers there in Caesarea the same as he indwelt the believers in Acts chapter 2 in Jerusalem. And Peter, almost astonished, says there's water here. Can anybody keep these guys from being baptized? I don't know if I should do this, but I think it's the right thing to do because I see God working in their lives. The other thing I think that's interesting is that Peter's week was changed. As you read the end of that verse, Peter stayed on for a few days. You know, here Peter was planning on, I don't know what he was doing, maybe he was taking a little bit of a siesta. He was taking a few days of downtime to say, you know what, I want to learn to tan some leather. I hear it's kind of therapeutic, right? <laughs> Simon's a tanner. Maybe that's what he was doing. Maybe he was just taking a vacation. And God said, Peter, I have something else for you. Learn some leatherwork skills. But God had plans to build intentional discipleship between Peter and Cornelius. And I truly believe that's what happened there. It is as Peter stayed on for a few days, he started walking through what he knows of God's plan for the early church. Plans are a good thing, but I think they can become our comfort zone as well. We can plan so much that we get stuck in that and say, God, I don't have any what we call white space in my life for you to intervene and say, I want you to do something else. You ever know not ever not known what to say to somebody? A few times, I see a few heads around there. Um, there's a song that's a little bit older called Every Man by Casting Crowns. And it talks about a few different people. Let me read it to you. It says, I'm the man with all I've ever wanted, all the toys and playing games. I'm the one who pours your coffee corner booth each Saturday. I'm your daughter's favorite teacher. I'm the leader of the band. I sit behind you in the bleachers. I am every man. I'm the coach of every winning team and still a loser in my mind. I'm the soldier in the airport facing giants one more time. I'm the woman shamed and haunted by the cry of unborn life and every broken man, nervous child, and lonely wife. Is our hope for every man a solid place where we can stand? In this dry and weary land, is there hope for every man? Is there hope that never dies? Is there peace in troubled times? Someone help me understand, is there hope for every man? If I could find someone to follow who knows my pain and feels the way, the uncertainty of my tomorrow, the guilt and pain of yesterday. You know, I think it's important to note that every single one of us who knows the gospel are stewards for God's grace. It's something that God's put in our lives to help us see who we are, to see who God is, to live it out wisely, and to bless others with it. It'd be like if I gave you a gift and said your job with this gift is to grow and change because of it and to bless others as well. God demonstrates to us, I think, that we need to regularly preach truth to ourselves <coughs> and to step out of our comfort zone. See, we have an internal voice in our heads. And I mentioned it earlier. 
that attempts to convince us that I couldn't build a relationship with them. Or maybe that I'm not up to the task. God, I'm not qualified. Or maybe even worse, God doesn't even care about that. You see, this passage really applies to Peter and Cornelius, but I think by extension it applies to us as well. Maybe you've thought about talking to a soldier. One of the comments I hear a lot in the airport or whatever, if I'm in uniform out in town, is thanks for doing what you do. And I appreciate that. It says that you notice, that you know that we are stretched very thin. But I want you to think about if you were a salesman and somebody came up to you and said, hey, thanks for doing what you do. Do you, do you know what I do or are you just saying that? Just talk to him as a person. Get to know him. In the army, we're, we wear patches on each shoulder. The left patch says where we're assigned. The right patch says where we've been, the unit we were deployed with. So ask what the patch means. They'd love to tell you about it. Ask where they're from. Sometimes that can be a long story as a soldier, especially as an army brat. Sorry, army child, no army brat. <laughs> Ask them where they're from. That's a long story. Ask Charlene. Where are you from? Well, I was born in Virginia. We just moved from South Carolina. We're going to Virginia. And who knows where we'll be after that? And imagine 20 years of that. You can get a long story and a long relationship. Find out some of their struggles, some of their challenges. You know, there's a saying that there's no atheist in a foxhole. And um, there's a video I want to show you here in just a second. This uh, unit is now known as the 101st Airborne Division, served in World War II. The series Band of Brothers was written to commemorate one of those companies known as Easy Company. As they stood up or created the unit, the commander said the 101st Airborne Division, which was activated on 16 August 1942, has no history, but it has a rendezvous with destiny. After completing a year and a half deployment from Normandy to the Battle of the Bulge, this clip shows the diversity of those returning from war. So if you can show that. Just see.
Alton and Moore return to Wyoming with a unique souvenir. Hitler's personal photo albums. He was killed in a car accident in 1958. Floyd Talbert, we all lost touch with in civilian life until he showed up at a reunion just before his death in 1981. How we lived our lives after the war was as varied as each man. Carver lived and became a glass-making executive in charge of factories all over the world. He has a nice life in North Carolina. Harry Welsh. He married Kitty Grogan, became an administrator for the Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania school system. Ronald Spears stayed in the Army, served in Korea, and 1958 returned to Germany as governor of Spandau Prison. He retired a lieutenant colonel. things and one of the hardest things for us as soldiers. He said, what do you need to do, or what you need to do is go back to your life as it was. But what that said to us versus World War II is there aren't factories pumping stuff out and the entire country is not involved in it. So there's almost a disconnect between soldiers and civilians. But I think it was the best thing because it told the terrorists, hey, you aren't going to win. By trying to take out a bar in Florida or a federal or state building in South Southern California or a couple towers in Pennsylvania or the Pentagon, you aren't going to win. Because we're still Americans and we're still going to do what we think we need to do the best way we can. But the other thing that clip tells me is that soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines, Coast Guardsmen go back into society where they left off. In a lot of ways, you'll see people who have ties to the military in almost every avenue of life. And so what the question I think is important is what is God doing in your comfort zone as you watch that video? You've seen God work miracles through opportunities to outreach to areas in this congregation. But what if that's just the beginning? You see, it's really not about our comfort zone. Cornelius saw it. Peter saw it. It's about God's comfort zone. But 
when you think about it, does God really have a comfort zone? When you watch the news, take an opportunity to pray for ministry <coughs> opportunities to soldiers, to sailors, to airmen and marines. I think public servants, those who serve our community, need to see stability in culture. They need to see that society cares about us and is willing to move forward with us. They also need to see stability in marriages. Take opportunities to mentor, to disciple, to connect with soldiers and show them what it means to have a marriage that honors God. Come alongside them and love them. And let them see that. You know, today's Father's Day. And maybe it's an opportunity to reach out to somebody who you know that lost a son, a lost a daughter in combat. One of my favorite families, Frank uh, Gross, was killed in combat in July 2011. And because I was asked to do his funeral at Arlington National Cemetery, we built a neat relationship. And uh, we kind of call them our Florida parents. Get a chance to check in on Craig and Tony Gross. Uh, be a blessing to them. Just call up and say, hey, how you doing? I love you and I'm praying for you. Just probably do that with Craig. Provide deliberate ministry to soldiers. Reach out to recruiting stations. Reach out to <coughs> National Guard bureaus. Don't do the cookie thing, because unfortunately there's a lot of questions right now as to what people's intentions are with communities that are around recruiting stations. But just to build a relationship with them and then send cookies in with them so that they know, they know you care about them first, not you're trying to do something to them. Accountability calls. The times I get calls from churches, from friends, from fellow believers are huge to me. To say, how are you doing and where's God at in your life? I can't ask as a soldier for things, but if you ask me a question, I'll be more than happy to bounce it off of you and help you walk through it and get some ideas on of how to provide deliberate ministry to soldiers. But I think another thing is about community outreach. Where can we get involved and where's God working? You see, it's not about our comfort zone. It's about God. It's about God's plan. It's about His work. It's about His glory. It's about Him pushing us to reach others different than ourselves. Let me pray with you. God, we thank you so much today for the opportunity to see Peter and Cornelius. This example to us, God, of two people who would have never connected except for your involvement in both of their lives. And God, we see that in Tracy today. We pray, God, that you would prepare both those with the message and those who need to hear the message. Connect them. God, we pray as a result of challenges in each of their lives and opportunities that you provide and help us to honor you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.